All right. Now this explanation will be focusing on cells, cell diagrams. Now one issue that I normally see with unit one students is understanding how to create proper cell notation and how to actually draw the diagrams. All right now let's say that we we have to have I'm um, talk about two different cells generally we have the galvanic cell all right versus the electrolytic cell all right so there are differences to these two now, firstly, in CSEC, the electrolytic cell is a cell that we normally look at. So what students normally do is mess up the charges on the anode and the cathode because they mix up these two cells. The electrolytic cell will look something like this. So if we're to draw a diagram of it, we're going to have one solution. And we know that to be generally the electrolytes. All right. And within this one solution, we're going to have two electrodes. And then we have a battery. Now that is the difference. So this is going to be a battery here. So this is the battery. All right. Now this states difference here between these cells. Usually we're going to have on this side, positive ions are going to be attracted to what we call the negative electrode. And this electrode will be the cathode. Right, I have a little issue there, cathode. And then we're gonna have a positive electrode in which the negative ions are gonna be attracted to. So that would be our anode. Now that's different. Note that this process happening here is not spontaneous, right? So it's what we call a non-spontaneous process. And in other words, it doesn't really happen by itself, right? It actually, act, it actually requires voltage or an external voltage, right? So power from the battery drives this reaction. Now this is an electrolytic cell. This is not what we normally look at in CAPE. In CAPE, we normally look at what's called a galvanic cell, where we start with half cells. A half cell is usually described as a metal, for example, iron, right? So a metal suspended in a solution of its ions. That's usually what a half cell is described as. A metal suspended in a solution of its ions. So let's say that if this is a metal ele ion electrode, then the solution will be of different iron ions at different oxidation states. Because we know that transition metals can form multiple oxidation states. So a half cell is usually a metal so in its solid form suspended in a solution of its ions, right? Just want to get that part straight. Now with the galvanic cell, notice that the solutions are actually separate. Solutions are actually separate and we end up having what we know as a salt bridge. So this connects the solutions. 
Now this salt bridge is usually made up of a, well, as the name suggests, salts, right? So whether it is a sulfate, right, or a nitrate, for example, if we have zinc sulfate ions, right, within it. Let's say that we have, um, yeah, zinc sulfate ions, right, on it. All right, we're gonna get to how the salt bridge actually works in a minute. Now, these are now connected, electron flow is now connected through a voltmeter. So notice that there is no battery. So it doesn't require an external source. And this is well because it's spontaneous. So this one is spontaneous and it does not require an external voltage. It actually produces its own voltage. So it's an electrochemical cell like that. So we have this. So this is usually what we have showing what's happening here. Now, I live by a rule of ABC. A B C meaning that we're gonna have our anode A or bridge B on our cathode on well on our cathode here C A B C So we're showing something like that A B C anode bridge cathode and that's exactly how we write it. Now within this type of cell now, the charges are flipped in which the cathode are positively charged and the anode are negatively charged. So this is what a galvanic cell looks like as opposed to or electrolytic. In electrolytic, the cathode is negative. In galvanic, cathode is positive. In the electrolytic, anode is positive. In the galvanic, the anode is negative. So we notice that. And electrons usually flow from anode to cathode. Now, let's get over some key terms that we talk about within this. Wait, before we do that, we're seeing that electrons are being left off within the anode and carried over to the cathode. Now, once this, once this reaction continues to occur, then there will be a buildup of charge. All right, there will be a buildup of charge. So let's say that there's gonna be a buildup of positive charge. Because as the electrons move, there's gonna be a buildup of charge within the solutions. And then the reaction will stop. The salt bridge actually allows the re-implementation, right, of charged ions to keep the equation going. So let's say in the zinc sulfate, the zinc ions will actually move towards the negative part to allow it to remain positive so the reaction can continue happening, right? So we don't want too many negative charges. So the zinc helps to reduce that. And same thing for the sulfate, the SO4, two negative will go into the, the now positive an anodic area and try to reduce the amount of positive charge buildup. So that is an important function of the salt bridge to maintain a charge distribution, a charge difference between the two solutions. So that's that. Now let's talk terms. The voltage that is captured by the high voltmeter or the high energy voltmeter, right, is what we call a cell potential. So it's usually measured in volts. Now the cell potential is also known as just the E naught of the cell. The E naught of the cell tends to be the E naught of the cathode minus the E naught of the anode. All right? 
and this just speaks to the charge distribution across the both cells so if electrons are moving from the anode to the cathode the electrons moving across create um, current so the movement of electrons gives us some type of voltage so that's a potential difference that the voltmeter is measuring across the wire now how do we know the e naught of the cathode and e naught of the anode we'll do that ex we'll do that through understanding our booklet or the information given to us in the question but how do we do this experimentally experimentally we have to find what we call a standard so we have to find a standard e naught of a cell in order to do that experimentally we have to have what we call a standard hydrogen electrode For the standard hydrogen electrode, let's draw a diagram. So a standard hydrogen electrode, all right, usually has a solution, all right, and we tend to have an apparatus that looks kind of funny like this. Make a little space here. So for a standard hydrogen electrode, we should remember from the electrochemical series that hydrogen would give a general zero volts, right? Therefore, well, let's hold that for now, zero volts. We're going to look at that. So hydrogen gas is actually pumped in at one atmosphere, right? The solution has to be a generally one TM cube or one mole per dm cube per se the concentration mole per dm cube and we're having it at a con at a temperature of 298 kelvin or we know 25 degrees celsius right so the hydrogen goes in and creates an acidic solution we also have here porous platinum right so the platinum if you look at it on a larger scale the platinum itself has pores so that it has lowells this increases the surface area all right for it to increase the rate of reaction with it because platinum is generally inert we're going to need porous platinum for the reaction to occur at steady rate that we can be comfortable with. Now, this standard hydrogen half electrode half cell, right, would what we say connect to another cell. Let's say it connects to another cell, right? And in this case, now we're just gonna have. Yeah, so in this case, no, let's see what we're going to have. Now, in some cases, we see that the half cell other side using another platinum electrode, right? Usually in some books and some books have the other half cell just being a solution of a metal of metal ions with metal suspended in it so for this case I'm just going to be using metal ion a metal half cell all right 